Welcome back to NASDAQ Trade Talks. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, global markets reporter at NASDAQ. Joining me at market site, we have Blaren, excuse me, Baralu. He's the co-founder and CEO of Matrix, as well as Raphael Duati. He's a professor of math at Sorbonne University in Paris, France. And we're going to be focusing on bringing math 2.0 to the global capital markets. Thank you both for joining us here at market site today. And um, first, we're going to talk about modern market theory. That has been in the press a lot lately, and it seems to be as if market participants are debunking what it's all about. How do you feel about that? Yeah, modern market theory, you know, started in the 50s. It was, you know, the famous Markowitz optimization, use of sharp ratio, and it's extremely used, uh, broadly used in the asset management. Yet, uh, markets become very complex. Uh, trading becomes more and more computerized, and the relation between assets become very complex. Uh, the risks, uh, actually the risks were always complex, it's not news. Uh, the models of uh, modern market theory were way too simple. And now we have actually the computer capability, the math capability, the, the type of uh, approach, uh, especially with uh, artificial intelligence, that allow us to look at the risk in a complete different manner and much better grasp it like uh, from uh, what we used to do in, so we had very simplified models. Now we have the access to way more um, extensive uh, models that can not only take prices into account, but also all sorts of data. And that's, you know, the, the So is there a new title for it? Is there a new theory, a new moniker that's being applied? It's one theory, there's many theories. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, my personal focus is uh, understanding everything about extreme risks, uh, black swans, you know, Taleb's uh, right. uh, black swans. Uh, the, the, the specific change, if you look at, you know, the, the behavior of, it's no news that the behavior of markets when you have a big event like 2008 mm -hmm. has nothing to do with the usual behavior right. of markets. Uh, the betas change, the correlation change, everything is different. So projecting yourself into a different scenario, that's, you know, if you do the appropriate, people have said, you know, math don't work any longer. Of course, if you know that piece of math, yeah, they don't work any yeah. longer. But math is a very, very broad area. And if you use the appropriate math, in particular, we, in our language, we use nonlinear math, the things that are outside uh, the, yeah. the, the, what they call, you know, portfolio theory, uh, then uh, the, the, you can, Actually, I mean, it sounds almost ignorant to say math doesn't work. <laughs> well, look, <laughs> right? if, if you look at <coughs> the history of Wall Street, if you progress into the 90s, it's the first time that, <coughs> let's say, major firms started bringing in PhDs in math. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why we say this is math 2.0, because the first, the first uh, products, uh, the first mathematical intelligence was basic portfolio theory, how to optimize, you know, then Black-Scholes, mm -hmm. pricing time, and so on. As Raphael said, uh, actually when we founded Matrix, it was uh, on the idea that we have a convergence, a singularity between technology and data science. What that means is that what was impossible to do in Excel, and we can see now Excel is running out of power for that point, you can now do it with data science. Mm -hmm. Okay, Is it artificial intelligence? No. It's augmented intelligence, because what we're talking about here is the human brain can easily uh, uh, probably uh, uh, account for hundreds of millions of permutations of life when they make a decision without even knowing. On the system one, as Daniel Kahneman says, and then you go and you analyze and so on. If you put it in a computer, things have to be more deterministic. That's why something like deep learning works very well for chess. That's why Google was very you know, uh, successful in being able to, to use machine learning and, and deep learning in order to outsmart other computers and standard methods. But when you talk about finance, the moment you start talking about more than three, four assets, and let's say in increments of 0.1%, you're trying to allocate them to a portfolio, then the problem explodes very fast. Right. So what you need here is you need, a, you, need a, you need the aggregation of intelligence of humans and machines. So today, uh, machines are there to augment human intelligence. And you know, with, uh, we can get a little bit more into yeah. how the modern portfolio is evolving. But what we are doing, for example, specifically, and you know, as part of this philosophy that we need to, to apply math and technology equally and substantially with human intervention. That's when we started working together with uh, uh, Professor Duadi. So what we have done in our, let's call it, uh, first minimum viable product that 
uses AI to better understand risk and, and portfolio allocation and portfolio management, we look at history as slices of paradigm in time, if you will. And people have known that. They've been trying to apply it through analysis of fundamentals. But what we're saying is that there exists a set of regimes or paradigms that define the behavior of the assets to one another. And if you can go back and model this type of behavior, there are only so many, if you will, so many permutations of behavior for the key factors that impact the market. And if you can uh, figure out, if you can cluster them, this is where the problem becomes mathematically quite complex. You know, you, you run 10 to the 30, 10 to the 40 permutations uh, uh, for your yeah. regression, but that's possible. What you cannot do is 10 to the 100, 10 to the, to, to the 200. And humans come in, they slice the problem, they say, okay, I'm going to put some human input. I'm going to say that this period more likely looks like that one. Now you can start to define some compartments, if you will, that explain why the market is reacting. So way. this new type of math, math 2.0, if you will, that's going to help you weather business cycles. It's going to help you manage periods of extreme risk better than if you were to have Not relied on a period of extreme risk. You see, uh, the the you could. Yeah, as Blaron was uh, saying, uh, you can, uh, if you look at history, and that I think any asset managers, it, what I'm going to say is completely obvious for them. Mm -hmm. uh, there are periods where things, you know, periods of rally, periods of recession, periods of downturn, periods of, you know, you, you get all sorts of situations, periods where uh, equity and, and fixed income is correlated, periods where they are anti-correlated periods where you know the credit spreads behave in certain manner it's, you you have all sorts of things and asset managers they, they know you know that they have to adapt to those things macro managers even better because they anticipate the different cycles so we know that some, when something happening i mean i took the example of extreme because it's absolutely stringent but it's much more general than just the extreme it's a various regime the sequence of various regimes they don't exactly repeat themselves but during doing uh, the, the appropriate probability theory, et cetera, you can say, well, you know, here's like when you throw the dice, it's not any dice that's coming. It's some of them, you know, you're more likely to go from one regime to another. And that's, you know, the exact uh, uh, rolling of the various regime that may come mm -hmm. one after the other. And that's exactly what, uh, that's where AI is coming into the picture. Uh, AI will help you uh, identify what are what the regimes look like. Now, it's like you know we create a big puzzle. If you look at with a, with a, with a focus on one every cell of this puzzle, in fact, in some sort within that cell of the puzzle, uh, modern mate, m modern portfolio theory is not completely outdated. It appropriate. Like if you look at a curve that is not a straight line, mm -hmm. if you look at locally at the curve, you know, at a piece of the curve, it looks like a straight line. It's not very far away, except that the slope changes. Right. And so you so have to adapt. Like, it sounds like data science is really changing portfolio management. Absolutely. Well, it, it has to. Let's it put it into to. a fifth grade level so it's mm -hmm. easy to, to explain, right? We know that there's a bunch of information, bunch of behavior, and, and changes in behavior, people know about this. What data science is able to do is, in a nonlinear way, capture all this information and quantify it so that you can reduce it to explainable information to someone who doesn't need to know math. Mm -hmm. For example, okay, oil and stocks are going up in this period and it looks like we are in the period where they actually go against one another with a chance that we're gonna go back to that period with this kind of probability and then you, you mix that stuff up. So it doesn't, uh, the idea here is to use uh, vast amounts of data, big data processing, and, and, and some data science techniques in order to control the problem so it doesn't become too big, but then uh, reduce the information where it's palpable for the usual investor, mm -hmm. right? And I think one interesting outcome here is that what you have is when you can quantify this data, you no longer need to call a financial advisor to call a financial advisor to call an insider who knows what's going on. Uh, so the first thing it will allow you to do as a portfolio manager, as, a, as an investment manager, is ability to act fast. Because computers capture the data and they can tell you right away. And there, there's, no, there's no investor bias, there's no portfolio manager bias and so on. The ultimate outcome of this is that uh, it's sort of like Uber has reduced completely the, uh, the necessity to call someone, to call a driver, to call a car. Right? You, you can control everything from your own 
uh, toolkit and, and you're able to see sort of what the probability of the market is to go a certain way or not and what has changed, what is the same. So right. it's mathematics that is explainable to the, to, to the most basic investor mm -hmm. that understands, okay, I see why the model thinks the market is going to go up or down. What you've had with systematic models before, primarily used within shops, is that they were black boxes that the, the, the math geeks understood. And, and that's what I wanted to ask you. Exactly. It's like everyone's quant models just became the same. They were all using the same formula, but when it comes to data sets, it's how the individual manager interprets it. So you might think this is a good piece of data. I might think it suggests something else. And here's how, here's how we are disrupting the philosophy of thinking here. Mm -hmm. Instead of developing these tools, which we would then use to manage assets, we're developing a model and a framework which, which we actually make it available to portfolio managers and to traders to then input their intelligence and couple them together. Right. right? That, so this that, is the big difference. It's, yeah. I, I don't think there are m many, if any, out there that are outsourcing their know-how around, the, around data science because once they figure something out, mm -hmm. say, oh, now I've got something, I'm going to go raise assets and we have too many asset managers. I think, I think, I think the, the, the irony is that, or, or almost the paradox is that this, the whole data science and quantifi quantifiable method has produced more asset managers, but ultimately is going to reduce them to very few asset managers because most of the information is going to be carried in the models and only the very select few are going to be able to add yeah. something above and beyond that. And I think ultimately, right. and, and maybe we should talk a little bit about right. the ETFs, what, what ultimately is going to happen is the, the, the Wall Street emperor is going to lose its clothes. Right. And we're going to see why there was a need for buying all the Porsches. And, and that's so why markets are so good, because they're all about Darwinism. It's, they will find a quick way to eliminate the outliers. Exactly. But I want to ask you, um, mm -hmm. um, Raphael, is there any merit behind active management anymore? Uh, sorry, is there any merit behind? Merit? Well, obviously, yes. Yeah. Now, the thing is that, yeah, it raises the bar, uh, the bar. I mean, mm -hmm. definitely, it makes it, I mean, if you compare to medicine, I mean, the, today, would you conceive a medical uh, unit without having a sophisticated imagery systems, uh, MRI, etc.? No. And the, the same medical unit 50 years ago was operating without all this technology, mm -hmm. except that today, uh, you would not even yourself, you know. The, on the other hand, would you completely trust a system that would be completely automatic? You press a button, you know, it takes a picture of you, it takes your blood, uh, etc. No. no, you need to have a real doctor looking at you, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, the doctor today has to know all that technology, otherwise they won't be able themselves to operate without that technology. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. Jill, so we are in that logic where uh, uh, you will have, uh, I mean, the, the good asset manager, those who will, as Baron say, mm -hmm. survive, it are those who will incorporate the technology in their day-to-day -day, uh, activity. But the fact that there will be a use for a human, that's obvious. And let me go here, just make a small comment about risk management. Mm -hmm. And let me reduce the brain to like another sort of computer. Mm -hmm. It's a computer that has, you know, those neurons, plenty of synapses, that is the connection between neurons within the brain. And so the reaction of a neuron is extremely slow compared to the reaction of a chip. Uh, we are talking, you know, a millisecond or something like this compared to a nanosecond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a factor a million between the, the speed of the two. Uh, except that we have many, many, many neurons. I mean, we are about in the billions of neurons and in the trillions of synapses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What people forget when they do machine learning is that you train a computer with, uh, you know, at identifying things with a training set. And you think, okay, yeah, I've put a lot of information in this computer, it's been training for hours, etc. Your brain, how long has been in training? I'm sorry for your age. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's certainly, you know, for many years. <laughs> mm -hmm. And on top of that, we inherit for a billion years of, uh, of biological evolution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that means that, in fact, our brain is prepared for risk management because it has in so many things. Of course, we have unconscious biases. We see a spider, we see a snake. We don't ask whether the snake is really venomous or not. We just run. run yeah. mm -hmm. But uh, the, the, the still, the brain is extremely trained for all sorts of situations that the computer would take, you know, years of training before they can even approach the capabilities of the brain. And that's a great point. And Blaron, I'm going to give you the last word because we need to wrap up here. I think more important than is active management worth it is 
which active management is worth it. These scientific methods for understanding the uh, true performance versus the market on risk-adjusted basis are going to reveal and, in my opinion, are going to prove my hypothesis I've had since first trading you know, at the turn of the millennium that something like 3 to 5% work hard and are smart and then the rest of them are pretty evenly di divided on, on, on random walk. So I think two things are going to happen. One is going to reveal who are the real active managers that are producing alpha. Secondly, the statement I'll make here is that those that will adopt data science or say more advanced mathematical approach to this will survive. Mm -hmm. The rest will be dinosaurs and that will happen very fast. They don't have any more, in my opinion, five to 10 years. I think the tide is turning very fast because you can see all these uh, the, the, the race to the bottom of zero mutual funds and so on, the gig is up. Everyone knows there's no free lunch. If it's zero fee ETF, it's either because they're recovering it through the short sale of stocks and borrowing of stocks and so on, but ultimately people are fed up with this sort of incompetence that is sold for, for, for some kind of uh, intelligence that really is just a random walk. So I think that's, that's the, the, the gist of what data science is gonna bring. Not that it's gonna replace the people, it's gonna reveal who works hard, who is smart, and also who is better able to use these tools in the future. Darwinism of the markets. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Great conversation. And thank you for joining me throughout the day. I'm Jill Melandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.